Carol Hound. Okay, let me start. Welcome to the CW Plus Carol Hollins Head Inspire Award Program, addressing health disparities for individuals with disabilities, identifying what you can do. We are delighted that you made time to join us for this inspiring afternoon. My name is Doreen Moroski, and I am the Student Program Manager at CEW. I want to acknowledge with gratitude that the Michigan University of Michigan resides on the traditional territories of the Three Fires people the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi. The program will be recorded and then we will pause it when, when we move into this section where we'll have breakout sections and discussion. CW empowers women and underserved individuals in the University of Michigan and surrounding communities by serving as an advocate and providing resources to help them reach their potential their potential academic, financial, and professional potential. We offer many services at CEW, one of them is which the program you're participating in today. We also offer free um, our educational and career counseling, as well as funding opportunities for, for students at the university. And this INSPIRE program, which you're part of today, The other thing we offer when it's not in our non-virtual times is we do offer study space and we also have staff and faculty advocacy that continues out through the world. And we also offer social work internships at the center. In these turbulent times, there are many challenges facing our complex world. As part of the CW initiative, we highlight and celebrate individuals that have found ways to focus their attention on creating positive change in areas that have meaning to them. The CEW Carol Hollins Head Inspire Award for Excellent in Promoting Equity and Social Change honors our former director, Carol Hollins Head's 20 year tenure at the Center of the Education of Women. Awardees are faculty, staff, and students, either as individuals or groups, whose sustained efforts have resulted in greater equity in regard to gender, race, class, age, disability, gender identity or sexual orientation. This multifaceted program aims to expand the vision of what is possible and to teach lifelong skills to underserved students and members of our community, empowering each to make bold and confident choices about their future. I have the honor to start the event with a mini guided mind mindfulness meditation practice to help us arrive, settle, and be more, more fully present as the afternoon unfolds. Being present in the moment is a skill that can be learned when practiced on a regular basis. Research on mindfulness continues to show the benefits that range from improving cognitive functioning, reducing implicit age and race bias, reducing the symptoms of anxiety, depression, and pain, assisting in ceasing ruminating thought patterns, and much more. Mindfulness may be viewed as a cognitive training that bolsters our ability to handle stress, poor mood, threat, and increases the capacity to focus our intention on what is most important to us. It also increases our capacity to be compassionate to ourselves and to others. So for the next few minutes, I invite you to silence or maybe actually even turn off your cell phones. And if, this, if, and if this is your first experience with meditation, um, no worries about it. I'm gonna guide you through this experience and we're just gonna take just a few minutes to really center ourselves. So to start, um, I invite people to get as comfortable as you are wherever you're sitting or laying if that's the case. Um, and so for those of us who are sighted, um, if it's comfortable for you to go ahead and close your eyes and if that's not comfortable, um, then just maybe avert your gaze into a neutral position. What we're trying to do with this invitation is just to really kind of uh, take out some of the visual stimuli, stimuli so we can really focus our, ourselves on being centered and going inward. I'm going to use a chime as a direction that just says we are getting started. I will ring it once and then we're done. I'll ring it three times and then I'll turn the program over to our presenter, Dr. Mead.
So just taking a moment to settle in. And knowing, knowing in this moment, you have arrived. Trying the best you can to let thoughts of whatever came before this moment, or maybe thoughts about what are coming next, to just drift by if possible. And the best you can to anchor your attention onto the sense of just being here. Maybe taking in the feeling, the sensations of your body as it's supported in whatever place you have chosen. Then just taking a moment to allow the body to settle. Maybe noticing whatever sensations are present for you in this moment. And maybe now taking the attention and trying to focus it inward the best that you can. Sometimes it's helpful to turn the attention to your breathing. And just to focus the best you can, your attention on the breath. Noticing the body taking in air and releasing air. And if it's comfortable for you, maybe allowing yourself to take full breaths, maybe three full breaths. So again, trying to take in as much air as you can on the in-breath. And then maybe pausing before allowing the breath to leave the body and empty the lungs as deeply as possible. Again, inviting another deep breath. Allowing the body to purposely take in as much breath and air as possible. And then again, allowing the body to release the, breath, the air. And one more deep breath. And now allowing the body to move into the pace and rhythm of the, of the breath that's most comfortable for you. No need to change it or alter it in any way. Just allowing the body to take in air and release air in a way that's most comfortable to you in this moment. Anytime you notice the mind has wandered, which the mind tends to do, just simply with kindness, trying to bring back the focus of your attention to your breath. And sensing the body as it's taking air, one breath after another. As the mind has stilled, maybe seeing if it's possible to invite a little bit more comfort throughout the body.
and before returning to the program, seeing if it's possible to maybe expand your awareness a bit and, be no and notice the sounds that are present in whatever area you are in. There may be sounds within your body or there may be sounds in the room. Whatever they are, just allowing them to be. And inviting you now to expand your awareness even larger, that knowing in this moment, you're part of a community that has joined together to learn and think and together become advocates. And expanding the awareness to knowing that the air we breathe is the air that all humans breathe around the world. I will now ring the chimes three times to bring our meditation to a close. Welcome again, and hopefully we're all here together now. Part of bringing mindfulness has been intentional to the Inspire space as, as we approach any, uh, any kind of issue or even just trying to bring our best self forward. It's often good just to center ourselves um, and to be grounded in the present moment. And now what I will do is I will turn over, I'm gonna introduce um, Dr. Mead to the group and I also want to say that today, as we move through our meeting, if there are questions that come up, feel free to use the chat fu function to, to, to bring your question forward. Uh, we may be, Dr. Mead may answer that question during the presentation now, or some questions may be saved to later where there will be a question and answer period. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Mead, and then she will have some more comments to introduce herself as well. Uh, Michelle Mead, is an associate professor in the Univ University of Michigan Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. As a rehabilitation psychologist, she conducts research with, provides clinical services to, and advocates for individuals with physical disabilities. Dr. Mead currently is a principal investigator and director of two federally funded interdisciplinary centers focusing, focused on disability issues. U of M Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center, the RERC, technolo Technology Increasing Knowledge, Technology Optimizing Choice, which is T-I-K-T-O-C, which is focused on developing and evaluating mobile technologies to enhance health, health management and interdependence among adolescents and young adults with disabilities. The Rehabilitation Research and Training Center in Investigating Disability Factors and Promoting Environmental Access for Healthy Living, which is focused on promoting healthy aging for individuals with long-term physical disabilities. Dr. Mead also serves as a co-chair of the Michigan Disability Council and the co-director of the U of M Collaboratory for Disability Health. Without that, without ado, I will welcome Dr. Mead. Thank you very much, Doreen. I love the meditation at the beginning. I think it, as you said, it has a wonderful for grounding and just allowing us to be present. I just wanted to touch a little bit more about who I am um, in terms of the background. I think I'm, more than ever, I'm recognizing my various roles. Uh, that as a mom, I have a six-year-old daughter who you can see there. And so figuring out parenting during this time. A daughter, to older parents who are, I'm concerned about their safety. They're, um, they're advocate and informal caregiver when it comes to health management issues. 
I'm a rehabilitation psychologist, as I mentioned, a researcher and a collaborator. More than that, I see myself as an advocate, as I've been very fortunate to have many individuals with disabilities share their stories with me. And so I feel a responsibility for continuing to take those stories and the information that they have provided forward. A couple of lessons I've learned along the way. I've definitely made a lot of mistakes. There have been things I've tried that haven't worked. And so just the touch, tap on, touch on a couple uh, would be try, make mistakes, fail forward in terms of recognizing what you learn from it and then keep going. Stopping really isn't an option. Um, more than ever, we recognize um, that other makes mistakes too, and so we'll be kind. Know that the world isn't fair. We very much see that. That's becoming increasingly evident someone to folks. But don't let that stop you from trying to make it so. Um, don't stop working for justice. Be authentic. That carries you through a lot. Just trying to truly understand, not to advance yourself, but really to advance the common good. Recognize what you do not know, um, and so collaborate. That's been one of my key uh, factors associated with my success, my willingness to just ask questions, knock on doors, and ask for help in terms of seeing and exploring issues. Identifying, identify and recognize your own strengths, as well as recognizing the strengths and skills of others making sure that your word means something. So once you start a project, finish. If you say you're gonna do it, following through. And then finally, developing a vision for your future. And I think hopefully today may help you do that. Um, I, there's so much going on that it is very much my hope that we can all together develop shared visions for enhanced disability justice, enhanced racial justice, enhanced health for everyone. So I wanna once again, thank you for coming. There's so much we are dealing with right now. The staying safe, finding information, making deform, informed decisions, and dealing with all the challenges of finally having a conversation and hopefully a meaningful national conversation about racial justice. Most of us have Zoom fatigue, and so this time here is precious. I wanna go over information, but at least in the last half hour, if not more than that, I wanna really talk and get, allow us to brainstorm and think about what we can do to make a difference, to move forward. So with that, um, this is about addressing healthcare disparities with individuals with disabilities, identifying what you can do. The focus is to increase knowledge, to enhance awareness, um, about possible steps, as well as some of the efforts going on here at the University of Michigan, and to identify modifiable factors in your own environment. So we'll talk first about disability and disability and healthcare disparities. Um, we'll talk about the difference between fixed and modifiable disparities and some steps to address those. Then we'll get into the brainstorming. That will probably be at two or, sorry, at three o'clock or a little bit before. Um, so, and we'll split off into breakout groups at that time, have about 10 minutes of discussion in those groups and come back and share. So what is a disability and who is affected? Somewhat, it depends on who you ask and I'll go into more of that, but Often folks view disability for, from their particular lens. In surveys and research, there are specific questions that are used. Are you limited in any way because of physical, mental, or emotional problems? Do you have special, do you have health problems that re, um, require special equipment? Do you have a substantial and in, in gain, are you, sorry, are you limited in terms of your ability to engage in meaningful activity or employment. Other disabilities come with a diagnosis, a screening, or a functional assessment. I don't, I think there's a problem in many of these because they're fixed. And I certainly reject the idea that having a disability means that you cannot work, um, except that perhaps 
you know, that's reflective of the lack of awareness or lack of willingness of too much of our culture to make needed accommodation to facilitate it. The definition or the model proposed by the international class, um, by the World Health Organization, is that international classification of functioning health and, or functioning disability and health, the ICF. Within this, um, so you see that um, it starts with an impairment that then impacts or affects what you do in daily life and independently do. Um, this, the activities may be things like being able to bathe, dress, or walk, and then those in turn affect participation. These are in terms impacted by both personal and environmental factors. Personal factors include age, gender, race, income, um, where environmental factors include the assistive technology available, the people around you and their, their knowledge and awareness and attitudes, and programs and policies. And this is the model and approach that's really accepted um, across the world and, and specifically, especially in the scientific community. The uh, official uh, short definition by the C C CDC is any condition of the body or mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities and interact with the world around them. And I'll show you the, the graphic that they came up with in a minute. Um, disability impacts all of us. There are over 61 million adults in the United States living with a disability. And there are more who are touched by disability as a family member, as a caregiver, as an advocate. That um, disabilities increase as we age. Um, that there are particular disabilities which folks seem to age into, um, such as hearing and vision disabilities, which get worse particularly in the late 60s and 70s, but there are many people living with a disability um, in childhood and as a young adult. And these individuals then often have different access to different options and resources. You do see, sorry, um, that the individuals with disabilities come from many different backgrounds or, and they have many different types. Uh, one of the classifications we will, sorry, breaks it down with regard to mobility, cognition, independent living, hearing, vision, and self-care. Um, with those, with the mobility uh, issues, identifying that most often. Individuals with disabilities experience significant health and healthcare disparities. I just want to take a minute to talk about what these are and how they relate to one another. That if we think of health and healthcare outcomes as a circle, as in here, that the social determinants of health are within that. And so things like opportunities, education, the environment in which you live, and that then impacts your health. Health disparities are differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of diseases and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups in the United States. When we think about differences in health outcomes, we may think about different levels of cancer rates among folks in a specific area or of a specific background. In contrast, healthcare disparities are differences in the quality uh, outcomes and satisfaction with health care services. They're one component of health outcomes, um, um, but I think they're the ones that I want to look at more specifically because as a health care providers, they're the ones that I think are our responsibility. But what you see is that our Individuals with disabilities have higher rates of early death, of suicide and attempted suicide. They have higher rates of hospitalizations, sedentary behavior, smoking and tobacco use. 
They have more preventable chronic conditions, more oral diseases, higher levels of dis executive dysfunction and health illiteracy. They're also more likely to undergo severe medical complications, to report only frayer or poor health, to experience social isolation, depression, anxiety, to report insufficient emotional support, and to identify risk factors for alcohol, substance abuse, and domestic abuse in service. And so for me, looking at these risk factors, looking at these uh, disparities that are experienced by, this, by individuals with disabilities, you would think that there, you would say that there is very much a need for our healthcare services to be tailored, to be open to them, to be responsive. And unfortunately, what we see is that individuals with disabilities are less likely to use medical services associated with preventative care or health maintenance. They're less likely to access to routine dental care, likely in part because of lack of coverage by uh, insurance. They're less likely to have counseling around issues of alcohol and substance abuse. And you can think about the various reasons for this. They're less likely to have treatment for mental illness. They're more likely to report on that barriers of care, cost barriers, times unable to um, access care, or encounters characterized by feelings of being disrespected or not listened to. They're low, 10 times more likely to report low satisfaction with regard to a healthcare service, and that increases um, increased severity of disability is associated with um, lower rates of satisfaction. Of course, and unfortunately, there are intersections here that women, black, indigenous, and people of color with disabilities, people living in poverty, children, LGBTQ individuals, and individuals in certain geographical areas experience even more, worse health and healthcare disparities. When we think of then of what we can do and what is going on, we go back to this ICF model. We think about what the body is, what the impairments are. And so I work primarily with folks with spinal cord injury. And for this group, we know that they may have paralysis. And so that may impact ability to walk. That in fact, in fact can impact a lot of other areas. But that, whether or not it does, is influenced by the other factors. Um, it can be influenced by their beliefs about working, about their, ability, their education, um, about their access to education and resources. It's definitely impacted by things like the policies, the transportation that's available to get to a job site, um, the ability to get into the buildings the location of the country and if it has jobs available, um, the environment, if it's extreme weather events in particular, what are healthcare or what are policies in that area to support employment? Um, and then what healthcare systems are in place? Between those two though, there is a connection. And so while what I talked about was with employment, we, if we think about health, we think about the same things with accessing healthcare. And so does our healthcare system have transportation associated with it? Can we get into the building? Um, does it allow it? And how does this intersection between personal and environmental factors play out? In particular, are, is healthcare designed um, to meet the specific needs of the individuals with disabilities. Is it affordable? Is it available? Is it accessible? Is it acceptable? And are there accommodations available? Um, and that then will affect the quality of the healthcare, the utilization of it, and unmet need, needs that still may occur. The what factors you need though to make a difference may be different for different people. And, so one of the things that I really want to talk about is some of this difference between fixed and modifiable factors and then factors based, based on that interactions. 
Um, so when we think about uh, personal factors, you can consider fixed factors such as race, age, past history, um, and the body structure or impairment that is going on. Um, and while much research often looks at these and associates them with outcomes, when we look at healthcare disparities, what we really want to look about look at is those modifiable factors, factors such as education, insurance coverage, the people's attitudes and beliefs, their behaviors levels of health literacy, and then psychological characteristics, such as resiliency, such as social support, um, and think about how those make a difference. When you think about environmental factors, there are fixed factors. If you decide to stay in a specific environment, you kind of have to put up with the weather there, um, including and the climate. There's the natural environment that are around us, but there are so many products and technology, um, human made changes to the environment um, and other things that shape what the experience and what functioning can be um, and influence of that process. And then finally, once again, there is a match between personal and environmental characteristics and we can then change or hopefully adapt the how to provide services based on where the person is that we don't always have to expect individuals to meet jump through the hoops of our systems we can specifically design environments and systems and programs to recognize and meet the needs of individuals with a range of functional abilities so I wanted to talk then about things that can be done and select efforts um, at the University of Michigan. In doing so, I wanted to really acknowledge the many groups that are doing this. I only have um, a limited perspective. I am, um, as mentioned, the uh, co-director for the Center for Disability Health and Wellness and the co-lead for the Michigan Medicine Disability Council. Um, there are many other groups, including the IDEA Board, including the Michigan Medicine, sorry, the University of Michigan Disability Council, including all of our providers in the physical medicine and rehabilitation, the M Disability uh, Group at um, the fam in the Department of Family Medicine, and uh, many other strong advocates and programs. Um, and hopefully, you know, we are connecting and working together, but there's definitely uh, room for improvement there. So when we think about what we can do, what we can do to once again address those healthcare disparities to make a difference when it comes to the, how we provide care and how that impacts outcomes. Um, we can think about consciously creative environments what can we do to optimize functioning and outcomes? We can ensure that we have things like um, appropriate clinical space, that the offices are wide enough, that the doors are wide enough, that we don't put equipment in the hallway. Um, we can do things like the um, real-time captioning service so that everyone can feel welcome. We can put components in the in space itself that seem welcoming, that are familiar, that are representative, um, so people feel comfortable. We train staff and faculty to provide needed services, to help folks, help folks with transferring. Um, and we integrate images of individuals with disability as healthy and engaging in wellness activities. We work to increase awareness. I think the University of Michigan uh, Council on Disability Concerns has put a lot of effort and done a wonderful job in doing this uh, with their Investing in Abilities Month each year. Um, I know we're trying to do this as part of the Michigan Medicine Disability Council. That way, the mighty event last year and others um, are working to acknowledge that 
um, to talk about what disability is and what it means, to acknowledge that disparities do exist. More and more, I think there is recognition of privilege, of working to make accommodations. With all of these, we want to, once again, identify our own strengths, biases, limitations, and priorities as systems and as individuals. In order to be a real re high reliability organization, we have to recognize the needs of different groups. We have to recognize how implicit bias plays out. Um, and we have to include uh, awareness about disability issues within that. Um, we also have to have awareness about how social determinants of health impact our patients um, and individuals. Too often, there, there doesn't exist a connection between the clinical space and the community environment. We have to optimize the attitudes of all stakeholders. Once again, promoting positive images and attitudes about disability, disconnecting the idea of disability from core health or quality of life, promoting expectations of participation, um, promoting the ideas of self-determination and reducing paternalism. And this can be hard to do in a medical system. Um, the, a lot of it, the medical model is based on knowing the right answer. The idea of that there may not be a specific right answer, but allowing people to make informed choices um, about their lives and trying to best determine how to manage their health in the way they think is best based on their priorities and their decisions. We want to eliminate judgment and once again focus on problem solving to advance mutually agreed upon goals. We want to form partnerships and encourage self-management and provide positive role models. With all of these, I think we're working to do these. Once again, events like MITE, um, partnerships with individuals uh, with disabilities um, and increased engagement of um, healthcare providers with disabilities allows this to happen. We're educating providers. This is always one of the key areas. Increased knowledge, you know, increased knowledge both about what has to be done to treat individuals and what it means to have a disability. Um, there's edu the work going on to enhance recruitment, admission, and retentions of individuals with disabilities in healthcare fields. Uh, Dr. Lisa Meeks, in particular, in the Department of Family Medicine, is doing a lot of work in this area. Um, not only increasing awareness about the experiences of students and faculty with disabilities, but also working to change um, admission policies and tests and to provide reasonable accommodations and support. We're working to in put classes on the curriculum about disability. In the, at, currently, the medical school only has a few hours about the topic and then folks go on to the next. It's a, a complicated issue with a lot that needs to be said. And so courses um, such as the one in pharmacy by Dr. Steve Erickson, an online um, program that will be starting in the fall, as well as rotations related to disability issues are critical in making a difference. Uh, we want to facilitate skill development and hands-on training. Um, this may relate to uh, how to communicate or how to even think about self-management and giving that back. We done a, created an online e-learning course about to facilitate primary care providers uh, learning how to, sorry, to teach primary care providers how to facilitate the self-management of folks with spinal cord injury. And we evaluated it. We found that being involved or taking the course not only increased knowledge about what to do and some of the issues, but increased awareness, um, positive feelings about engaging in a self-management process and looking at the uh, health management in a different way, not just as are they doing what I want them to, but do they have the skills to make an ability to 
to do what they they want to to be healthy um, and then the idea of also increasing feelings of comfort with regard to working with individuals with disabilities we need to as we educate providers we need to make that information um, immediately you know digestible and immediately relevant we need to provide it in uh, both just-in-time information, healthcare practice alerts, as well as um, consultations. And I'm sorry if anyone is um, trying to share, I don't have access to the chat right now. So during, if, if anytime you wanna see something and wanna jump in, please do so. We have to gather data. You know, we don't know what we don't know until we ask. Um, we can't especially make comparisons or identify healthcare disparities unless we're measuring something. Dispar identifying disparities is based on differences. And so we have to use and develop standardized measures appropriate for individuals with um, disabilities. This both means asking uh, about asking standardized questions to identify disability status um, so that comparisons can be made and then to make sure when we provide assessments whether it's based on depression or personality or cognitive ability or such that we do so in a way that is valid um, there are many tests that um, that may be done either based on uh, motor speed or hearing or sight um, that just can't be used and so figuring out what those are. Um, we want to, once again, know who we're working with and identify their strengths, abilities, and vulnerabilities so that we can better tailor the interventions or services they receive and hopefully improve the outcomes from receiving those services. Um, this kind of, um, once again, talks to what the idea of education of providers and in integrating healthcare providers with disability. We not only at the works of Dr. Meeks, but we also have to create pipelines and role models. Just as there are issues with representation of indi black, indigenous, and people of color in healthcare fields, so there is issues of the representation and awareness that individuals with disabilities can be healthcare providers. And that many ways, their background provides them with unique insight um, with regard to the experiences um, and more em some empathy to the process. It also then enhances the awareness and um, lessens the bias of their colleagues. And so going out and letting folks know as letting children know, children with disabilities know that it is possible to be a healthcare provider, whether it's a physical therapist, physician, nurse, psychologist, or anything else. We need more folks who are aware of what the issues are, who are willing to be um, part of the solutions in terms of enhancing our healthcare system and making sure that it is relevant to all individuals. We need to ask. Do you have a disability for which you need an accommodation? This would seem like such an obvious question, and yet somehow it can easily be overlooked. When you, um, as part of the Michigan Medicine Disability Council, we've looked about issues of accommodations, and you type it into the website, and what you find is lodging. Um, and so the idea of asking about accommodations needs to be something that we put in a standardized place in the medical record and is asked once and not over and over again, that it's not embedded in a note, um, and that we are then prepared to make that accommodation when uh, the patients come in the room. And it needs to be both a, a disability or an accommodation that needs to be made um, for a patient or their family member. Um, Krista Moran in particular is leading this charge and working with the folks at Effort. Epic. We hope to have this soon integrated um, with at least initial questions about type of disability and then requesting information about what type of accommodation may be needed. 
one of the focus factors here that many individuals who have functional impairments or who use wheelchairs or walkers may not specifically think, okay, I got a disability. Particularly older adults may think, oh, but I'm, I just can't walk or I just need to use a scooter or oxygen and um, how that fits in. But nevertheless, we have to be prepared as healthcare providers to provide assistance and to know when not to, um, but definitely to provide the necessary equipment and rooms for this process. Um, so we gotta ask. This will also allow us to then go back and say, how are we doing? And when we do satisfaction polls, we can then compare. Are we doing okay um, with providing services to individuals with disabilities? This is the only way we're gonna change. We have to see what we know, where we're doing right, but also where we're doing, what we're not doing, or what is that we're not seeing at this time, so that uh, we can make changes and improve things. We need to keep screening for functional deficits. Sometimes folks don't realize, especially if it's a slow onset of a disability. So we have to continue to do screenings of hearing, vision, cognition, mobility, self-care, and independent living. And then we actually have to do something with the information. Um, one of my personal pet peeves is when we uh, identify issues with cognition and then don't make any accommodations. We don't provide information in a different way. We don't, uh, if we know individuals may have issues with memories, we don't look for secondary sources of self-report data about history or uh, what is going on. Um, we need to use the information that we collect in order to make things better. We, in order to adapt and tailor care, and once again, if we find that there are, uh, that folks have cognitive deficits, that there are specific ways that individuals learn, if we know that they're not able to problem solve very well, we need to change our approach. We need to provide the services that they need rather than just push the services that we have convenient or easily available. We need to consider and keep supporting families and social networks, um, providing them with information, involving them in care um, and advocating for policies and programs that recognize and accommodate competing demands. We need to once again develop interventions and programs that consider cost uh, scalability um, that are realistic about issues with transportation and travel. Um, and if nothing else, you know, the, the pandemic and the concern for safety, I think has really pushed us to think about what can we do? What innovations do we need, particularly as related to telehealth? What more can be, what really needs to be done in person and what can be done at a distance? And then who needs to travel? Does it always need to be the patient or are there other options available? We want to engage in commu with communities. Health occurs not in a hospital or a clinic, but in the context of people's lives. And so that is, I think, where we need to be working. We need to be, you know, being informed by patient and community advisory panels. We need to be including individuals with disabilities in quest for solutions. We need to be working with opportunities for health and wellness. There are a couple of great programs now here at University of Michigan working on adaptive sports for individuals with disabilities. We have the UMAS program, which is uh, more focused on the uh, recreational and initial levels with children and adults. And then we have more of a collegiate um, program led by Dr. Okalami. Um, and both are really important in terms of changing the conversation, not just exercise as treatment, but exercise and physical activity as engagement and wellness, and then providing the, the visual of we're all part of this. Everyone needs to be included. And so when you think about developing something, the range of what you're thinking 
needs to be enhanced and expanded. And finally, um, sorry, I think I have two more. Knowledge translation, we wanna make sure that when we do research, that we, when we do programs, we integrate what we know. We in integrate re research knowledge, best practices, we promote it, to technology is developed, we integrate it into the healthcare system in ways that make sense. Um, with the Rehab Engineering Research Center, um, you know, those, and my work through that, that became really evident. We developed um, apps, but where it fits and how it's supported by our healthcare system versus another entity such as an app store or, or such becomes confused. And then the idea of um, individuals collecting information, whether through Fitbit or others, and doctors able to be able to see um, and use that information in a meaningful way. Review and update policies, really important. Know what your policies, department and institutional policies are and continue to work for improve them. I've been blown away by the recent work of the U of M Council on Disability Concerns and their advocacy during this time, their advocacy to ensure that the president and of the University of Michigan and all of the leadership are recognized um, and accommodate the individuals with disabilities who are the leaders, the learners, the patients and the providers here, um, and the educators. So we, and once again, we wanna increase awareness about the impact of state policies within this. Uh, and finally, we wanna collaborate. These are some of the individuals who are passionate groups of people who are trying to work to improve things, getting involved, make a difference. My own, the group that I mentioned is the U of M Center for Disability Health and Wellness. This is open to all members of the University of Michigan community. And the focus is, is once again on um, using research, education, and training clinical, clinical care and uh, community outreach and advocacy in order to uh, address inequities in healthcare access quality and outcomes for individuals with disabilities across the lifespan. So now it's your turn. This is where we, uh, in a few minutes, we'll be going to breakout groups. So with that, what will happen is that you will be randomized into breakout groups to consider what is possible and what you want to commit to doing. Um, when you get into the group, I want you to choose a reporter um, who can be sort of dis um, record the discussion and the decisions that are made within the group and then report it back. So your specific charge is to, sorry, back. Briefly, So your charge is to identify a specific type of disability related health or healthcare disparity that you wanna focus on. Think, is this related to clinical care, education, um, some other factor? Discuss its scope and what's involved with it. What, who does it happen to? What is modifiable? Um, identify a factor that you see as personally or agree on a factor that you see as personally modifiable given your unique skills, roles, and networks. While it would be great to say we're gonna change federal policy right now, it may be that um, that is too big to do as an individual or even as a small group that you, you start smaller. And so think about your unit, think about your organization and feel what your comfort level is and your position is within there. And then identify one or two actions that you can take towards addressing this and the barriers that will likely be come up. We don't wanna be unrealistic. There are gonna be challenges to this process. And we, if we are able to identify what those are, we can be ready to address them as they come along. So as you go into groups and well, uh, Shay is gonna be dividing uh, this who's ever left on the line now into groups about sex. I'd like you to each once again, briefly introduce yourself, 
identify who you are, sort of say a word about your position, and then identify the key problems that you have seen or experienced related to healthcare disparities among individuals with disabilities. As a group then, once that's done, based on those experiences, choose one area to focus on. Define the scope of the issue, identify the modifiable factors, and figure out the one or two steps that each member can take to personally address this. Thanks. Um, so in short, sorry, healthcare disparities do exist. I think you've all are very aware of that. Um, we, we just need to break, we be, need to begin to break it down and figure out how to partner to piece, to keep pushing little bits of this at a time. And we don't need to always carry the whole thing on our shoulders all the time. We need to take breaks, we need to be affirmed. And then we, you know, if we fall, we need to keep, get back up and keep going because this is our lives. This is our lives, or our friends, our colleagues, our families. We're, and I think it's important to have that vision for ongoing, that what we do matters. So thank you, what you do matters. I appreciate your being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Michelle. That was really inspiring. And again, finding ways that we can all do something uh, to make a difference and, and again, bring the awareness, which oftentimes, um, again, is the missing piece mm -hmm. to, to making the action happen. Um, so in closing, what I'd like to also just acknowledge is that after this recording today, we will be sending an evaluation out as, as all as we will also be sending the recording. and. If you want to share that with people that maybe weren't able to join us, um, please do. And we do appreciate you taking a couple of moments, if you don't mind, uh, with the evaluation. As we all are learning this new virtual world and trying to bring programs to you, um, it's really helpful for us to have that feedback. Um, please check our website out for um, more upcoming events. Uh, we will be having, we are going to go forward, we have an advocacy symposium that will be taking place on September 10th. Um, we're moving it again from an in-person to an online um, platform. And so again, you, that's where we're gonna be showcasing the, um, the Carol Hounds Head Inspire winners for the upcoming year. We'll be doing, giving their lightning talks um, during that symposium. Um, so, and again, I think you can see by the, the caliber of people who bring their passion and good work um, in front of us. Um, I have to say personally, it's been really amazing to work um, with this program and with the, with the presenters um, bringing forward. So thank you again, Michelle, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the program. I hope to see you again. Great. Thank you all.